Now give me just a moment because I am not seeing that the recording has started. I see a little red light on my screen, Cheryl, if that helps. Very it's good. Rip crack. Very good. Okay. Thank you for your patience, everybody. So you see a red light on your on your monitor? Yeah. And it's great. Rex, do you see one? Um, no. Okay. It says yes, recording. So it looks like you're recording. All right. Very good. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started, okay? Let me get, uh, take it away, Rex. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, first off, welcome everybody to Citrus Heights Water District's virtual water smart classes for homeowners. Um, we're excited to be holding these this year in these uh, different times with the COVID-19 uh, out there. So um, this is our way to adapt and, and move forward with um, reaching out to our customers and offering these classes. So thank you again for attending. Um, I want to um, welcome the instructors. You have some very qualified folks here today that are going to speak. And um, one of the number one things we need to know is about the soil. So you'll get, you'll get a lot of that today. Um, I do want to offer you some uh, uh, services that Citrus Heights Water District has available to all of our customers, and uh, mainly their, their rebates. We have some um, ultra low flow toilet rebates available to our customers, and all the information is on our website at ch wd.org. Um, you can find out about our rebate, our high efficiency toilet rebates. We also have a, a pressure reducing valve rebate that we're rolling out um, for our customers because we do have some higher pressures in our in our district that uh, can cause uh, problems to some of the uh, sprinklers. And um, there's also a a uh, water audit we can do for your irrigation system. So if you have a system in place with a timer and everything, we can come out, run it, um, give you some advice on um, maybe some things that may not be working properly or on how to improve the efficiency of your coverages. And um, it takes about an hour, it's free. All you have to do is call to sign up or go on our website again at chwd.org. So, Let's make this short and get this the good stuff started here. <laughs> Welcome, Cheryl, and take it away. Thank you very much, Rex. So again, if we have he healthy soil, we're going to have a happy landscape and especially happy plants. My name is Cheryl Buckwalter, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I am a landscape designer and consultant, and I have a number of water-efficient landscape certifications as well. But what's really important to you all today, I think, is to know that, yes, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available, and you can see the link here on the, on the main page where you will be able to find the webinar as well as any resources that are provided in the other, um, the upcoming webinars as well, um, tomorrow and the next day. So please, if you have any questions, just enter your questions into the chat box. There's a little box enter your question there, and at the end, we will have a question and answer time. Also, it would be wonderful if you would complete the survey that you will receive soon after the webinar. We are always striving to improve the information that we provide, and we want to learn what you want to learn about. So please sign up for the next webinars if you're able to attend with us, and welcome, and I will turn it over to Steve Zion. Thanks a lot, Cheryl. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I have a degree from the University of Wisconsin in soil science and 45 years experience in managing healthy soils and in, orga in organic horticulture. And I'm here to tell you that the soil is alive. Now mulch always covers a healthy soil and so today's mulch is what we are going to be covering, uh, which will include things like who creates healthy soil. What do they do? Where do they work and play? Why growing organically is crucial. When and how long you need to irrigate. 
and how your actions impact sorrow health, both for the good and the bad. And I'm going to ask you, don't treat your soil like dirt. Soil is a lot more important than you think. Next slide. Steve, will you try to get a little closer to the microphone? It's sounding a little bit garbled, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, next slide, please. So where do your plants live? Do they live in soil or do they live in dirt? Next slide, please. There are three basic components of a healthy soil. The chemical component making up of nutrients, pH, and pesticide residues, the physical component, which would be soil struct or soil texture, and the biological component um, that until recently we didn't think was really important. And we have to have all these three things in line in order to have a healthy soil. Now, soil texture is really, really important. Um, you need to have a, you need to know what your soil texture is. So you take a jar, you fill it one third of the way full of soil, removing any sticks and stones that are there, fill it two thirds of the way full of water, make sure you put the lid on tight and then you shake it and then you shake it and then you shake it. And when you're done shaking it, you shake it some more. Then finally you set it down and you let that soil settle till the water is clear. Next slide. please. And then you'll see in that jar that there are three layers of soil. The sand will have settled in the bottom, the silt in the middle and the clay on top. And then you can take a ruler and figure out what the percentage of each one of those is. Then you go to the soil textual triangle on the right, and let's say we've got 30% silt. So look on the right and see where it says 30 and go down to the left. And then we we'll, let's say we've got 30% sand along the bottom and we move up towards the left. And where those two meet is right in the center of that triangle, right at the bottom of the clay area. And so we now know that we have a clay soil. So it's really important to know what our soil texture is, next slide, because it affects our pore space. Now we've got three raised beds here. We've got one on the left that is sand, the biggest soil particles will represent those by basketballs and watermelons. Silt in between sized soil particles represented by softballs and grapefruit. And in the raised bed on the right, we've got clay representing golf, uh, golf balls and eggs, and it is the smallest soil particle. Now, which one of these raised beds has the most pore space? By far, it's the clay. The pore spaces are much smaller, but there is a huge uh, amount more pore space in that clay soil. So which one holds more water? Well, more, the water exists in the pore space. So if there's more pore space, there's more water. Why is that important? Well, for one reason, if it's going to be hold, if the clay soil is going to be holding more water, you're not going to have to irrigate as often. Next slide, please. Now here we've got two soils. On the one on the left is a sandy soil, and we've got water dripping down on top of that sandy soil. And with, with those large pore spaces, when it hits the soil, gravity is going to pull it down into the soil relatively quickly and move it through the soil, and it's gonna pretty much go straight down. Now, if we have the same thing happening on the right side with a clay soil, the pore spaces are too small for gravity to have any effect. The water moves through capillary action, or basically gets sucked into the soil and through the soil. So it moves very, very slowly. And so you're gonna to have to apply the water much more slowly. And not only does it move down, but because it's being sucked through those pores, it moves off to the sides. And so if you've got, for example, a drift system, you're gonna to have to run those drift lines a lot closer together on a sandy soil than you have on a clay soil. Um, next slide, please. So what happens if you don't like your soil texture and you're gonna add sand to your clay soil? What are you gonna get? You're gonna get cement. So I don't think any of you want to garden or landscape in cement, so don't try and alter your soil's texture. Next slide, please. What soil texture is best? Whatever you have. There are advantages and disadvantages to all of these. Next slide, please. So can you improve the function of your soil's texture? Most definitely. And how do you do it? 
by creating soil structure. Next slide, please. Well, what the heck is soil structure? It's where you get the individual soil particles, the sandstone clay particles and organic matter and soil biology and maybe even a little bit of fertilizer get glued or tied together to form aggregates. And then those aggregates get glued and tied together to form structure. Next slide, please. The result of that structure is you get a diversity of pore spaces. You get these large pore spaces where after you irrigate, gravity pulls the water out of there. So you have air in your soil. Then you have medium-sized pore spaces where that's most of the water that your soil biology and your roots use. And then where that blue arrow just popped in, those are really tiny pore spaces. And that's where the soil biology can hide the really small critters so they don't get eaten. Next slide, please. So how do we build soil structure? Next slide. We create a healthy soil. Okay, well, how do we create a healthy soil? Next slide, please. First thing we've got to realize that healthy, healthy soil is full of life. There's lots of critters there. Next slide, please. A teaspoon of soil contains more organisms than there are people on Earth. Now, some of you maybe have worked out in the garden earlier this morning. You washed your hands, but you didn't get a manicure. So you've got a little bit of soil underneath your fingernails. Just imagine how many little creepy crawly critters from the soil are living underneath there right now. Next slide, please. Now, if you talk about all the critters that live in the soil, the bacteria and earthworms and fungi and mammals, roots and organic matter, if you take that as a whole, it is known as the soil food web and they all interact and work together to create a healthy soil. Next slide, please. Now, soil biology is what creates the soil structure that we were just talking about. Algae, bacteria, mycorrhizae, glue the sandstone and clay particles together. Fungi, actinobacteria, and mycorrhiza are thread-like structures that tie the soil together. And then there's the protozoa and the nematodes and the worms. Those are bigger guys that push the soil around as they move through the soil, creating those large pore spaces. So it's the soil biology that turns that dirt in the back on the right into soil. Next slide, please. Now there are numerous benefits to having good soil structure and a healthy soil. The most obvious and the one you're gonna see the most is where if you've got good soil structure and you irrigate or it rains, the water is gonna move into the soil. But not only does it move into it, it will move through the soil. Nutrients, roots, the worms, all the soil biology is gonna be able to move through the soil much more easy. With good soil structure, you're gonna have air down there in those large pore spaces, resulting in fewer water-related diseases. Next slide, please. Now here we've got a picture of a, a tree, and on the left, it's growing in healthy soil, which has an abundant and diverse population of soil biology and has a healthy soil food web resulting in a well aerated good soil structure. So look at all, look at the extent of those roots. You have this great huge root system. Now on the right, we have an unhealthy soil. It's virtually almost dead. There's almost no soil biology. It's become compacted. You don't have much of a root system. And so the tree looks really, really sick and it's gonna be much more susceptible to pest problems. Next slide, please. Now, in order to have a healthy soil, another thing that you need to realize is you need to avoid or at least minimize tillage. Tillage actually compacts the soil. It destroys the soil structure and it kills a lot of the soil biology that creates soil structure. So you end up with a compacted soil in the long run. And if you look at that lower slide on the right where those arrows are pointing, you might be able to see that there's a hard pan form. Uh, because that was filling at the same depth for a couple of seasons. And then water, nutrients, roots can't get through there at all. Next slide, please. Now, roots, when they're living in a healthy soil, live amongst what's called the rhizosphere. Now, the, that big, huge tube in the center, that's the root, the little yellowish things coming out. Those are the root hairs that normally do uh, the, the feeding. But now with this healthy rhizosphere, all those little dots and lines, that's the soil biology. And they live around the roots. And what most people don't realize is that plants spend about 40% of their energy feeding the soil biology. They actually exude chemicals that will feed the soil biology. For example, 
plants are smart. You may not think so, but plants are really smart. If they, for, for example, the plant says, oh, I need phosphorus. I'm trying to produce tomatoes and I don't have enough phosphorus. The roots will exude a particular chemical that will encourage microscopic organisms that make phosphorus available to the roots to work harder. And so now we'll get more phosphorus. If that plant root is being attacked, it will exude chemicals that will either fight off that pest directly or encourage microscopic organisms to fight them off for them. So there's this mutually beneficial relationship between the soil biology and the plant roots. Next slide, please. So we need to, when we're fertilizing, think about the fact that we're feeding the soil. We need to get away from the idea of feeding the plant. Next slide, please. Now, when we're thinking about fertilizers, we, there are two things we have to consider. The first one is salt. And there are fertilizers that are high in salts, and those are your synthetic fertilizers like Miracle Grow and Perk Builder. And if you look at that slide on the right, on the top, that blue area, that's the water in those medium-sized pore spaces. The white dots are the salt from the fertilizer. You can just fertilize. Now, salt has an affinity for water. It doesn't want to let it go. So if it's holding on to that water in those medium-sized pore spaces, the area on the right there, kind of tannish area, that's the root. And it's having a hard time obtaining the moisture. You can see those arrows of water are very, very small that are moving into the roots. And you can actually get fertilizer-induced plant wilt. Now, if you look at the lower picture on the left, the salt content is so high that salt is also a dehydrating agent and it'll suck the moisture right out of the roots. The roots will shrivel up and die and so will the plant. And that's what's called fertilizer burn. Now, if you can suck up the moisture out of something as complex as a root, imagine what it does to the soil biology. You can see on that lower slide on the right, there's almost no soil biology there. So there's not that mutual benefit. The roots can't get enough moisture, they can't get enough nutrients, and that root kind of shrivels up and it's gonna show up on the top of the plant as well. Next slide, please. To the rescue, we've got the low salt fertilizers. Hooray! We've got the, and these are organic fertilizers, things like earthworm castings and compost. And if you look on the lower left, we've got that similar slide. Uh, there's a very little salt in this water, so you're not going to have uh, any plant wilt. Uh, the low salt content is going to not harm the soil biology. It actually is going to feed the soil biology. So you get that nice, healthy rhizosphere that you can see in the lower right, and you get that nice, healthy root. Next slide, please. Now, when you're choosing for, uh, fertilizers, the other issue you need to consider is solubility, how it dissolves in water. And there are the water-soluble fertilizers. Again, these are your synthetic fertilizers. And if you look at the label in the middle there, and we've got that circle there, that first number, that's the amount of nitrogen. It has 32% nitrogen. And if you look where the arrow is pointing, it shows that only of that 32%, only one half of 1% is water insoluble. So what that means is that when you put that fertilizer down, because it's almost all soluble, it's going to dissolve in the water. And wherever that water goes, that fertilizer is going to go with it. Now, you've put this fertilizer down before. It's got high in salts. You killed the soil biology. So there's no rhizosphere, as you can see in the upper right. There's no uh, structure being formed. The soil becomes compacted. And when you fertilize and irrigate, most of that water is going to run off, go across the sidewalk, into the gutter, and directly into our creeks and streams. That's where a lot of that fertilizer is going. A little bit that does get into the soil, most of it's going to miss the roots because, and there's no soil biology to grab it, so a lot of it's going to leach down into the groundwater. So even though you've got 32% nitrogen in that bag of fertilizer, only about 2 or 3% of that is going, actually going to get into the plant, not very cost effective. And these materials, because they run off and leach, you've got to buy them about once a month. Now, if you look at that picture in the lower right, there's all those little yellow dots. Those are everybody's favorite. Those are aphids. Now, what happens when these water-soluble uh, fertilizers come in contact with the roots for the short period of time that they do, it tells the plants to grow really, really fast, so fast that the cell walls don't get a chance to develop. They become very, very thin. They look healthy because they're thin. They show the green color, 
but they're not healthy, they actually send out chemicals through those thin cell walls that attract things like aphids and white flies and moving bugs. When the pests get there, thin cell walls, easy access, party time. Next slide, please. Again, to the rescue, we've got your organic fertilizers, the earthworm castings, and the uh, finished compost. And these are water insoluble fertilizers. They're not gonna run off. They're creating that healthy soil food whip because they're low, low in salts. The nutrients are going to move into the soil. They're not gonna run off. They're not gonna leach through the soil because they're being held by the soil biology. So even though this bag of fertilizer in the upper right only has 5% nitrogen, that first number, 95% of it's gonna get absorbed by the plant. So you get a lot more bang for your buck. Even though this has 5% nitrogen, it's gonna get two to three times more nitrogen into the plant than that synthetic fertilizer that had 32%. Because the soil biology is holding on to these nutrients and, and releasing them to the plants over time, you only have to apply these materials about every quarter. And because they're releasing them slowly over time, the plants are gonna grow at their normal rate. They're gonna have really thick cell walls, making them more pest resistant. Next slide, please. Um, now we also need to realize that when we're improving soil health, we need to feed the soil. So we need to use organic fertilizer, okay? Not synthetic fertilizers that basically kill the soil biology. Next slide, please. We also have to avoid using pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, all are very detrimental to the soil's biology and they will kill them. Next slide, please. Proper irrigation is also really, really important. We've got to realize that your plants need oxygen and air, both. And so we can't water too frequently. Next slide, please. Now, a lot of people, especially beginning gardeners, um, they don't know how to irrigate this, so they're going to ask their friends, maybe on the other side of town, or maybe they've got a friend in the Bay Area, how do you, you irrigate? And think that they can irrigate the same way and they will have success. It's not going to work. Your soil is unique. It's different. It's going to need different irrigation requirements. So you'll go into the nursery and you're going to ask the professionals, how should I irrigate? And if they tell you anything more than you need to water deeply and infrequently, they're probably going to give you the wrong advice because they don't know your soil structure. They don't know your soil's texture. You, they don't know how much water your irrigation system puts out, whether you've got a slope, whether it's a sunny area or a shady area. So how do you figure out how to irrigate? Next slide, please. You check your own soil's moisture, okay? You use the tool on the left, the soil probe for in the landscape. And for raised beds and containerized plants, you use the tool on the right, which is called the soil sleuth. And you push these into the ground and you pull them out and you will be able to see the soil and measure whether it's moist or not. Next slide, please. Here we've got our soil sleuth in the slide on the left. You pull it, you push it in, you pull it out, and that soil is very light in color. And if you were to touch it, you could feel that it's very, very dry, indicating it's time to irrigate. Okay. Now the when you're irrigating, what I tell people to do in, when they're first learning how to do that, water half as long as you normally do. Wait for an hour so that the water will leach down into the soil as far as it's going to go due to gravity. Then you shove the soil probe, or in this case, the soil sleuth, into the ground again. And you'll see how far down that water has gone. And if you look in that middle slide where the arrow is pointing, you'll see that, that there is some soil there that's still dry. So that's as far as the water has gotten down. If you've got roots down farther, farther than that, you've got to irrigate for a longer period of time. And then that soil sleuth on the right shows that the soil is moist all the way down. Next slide. Now we've got the soil probe. The soil probe on the left, that soil is obviously bone, bone dry. You'll be able to see it and feel it. Uh, then the next, the, the one in the middle, uh, the soil in the top third is somewhat moist. It's a little darker. The next third of the soil, parts of it are dark, parts of it are light. So the water is just getting down there. And in the bottom, it's still bone dry. So you definitely know that you need the water for a longer period of time. And then we've got the last soil probe on the, on the right. That soil is nice and dark and moist all the way down. Next slide, please. So Karen Ross, the Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture states, we need to pay attention to what's feeding our soil so it can continue to feed us. 
And as far as I'm concerned, it feeds us both physically in our vegetable gardens and spiritually with our landscapes. Next slide, please. So when you're thinking about soil, you now understand it's not the soil itself, it's the soil life that is the most important element. Next slide, slide please. Soil is life and we have to conserve it. We've given you a whole bunch of healthy soil tips and now it is your responsibility as someone who is nurtured by the soil to utilize this information to grow healthy soil and healthy plants. I wanna thank you for your time. Hope you learned something. And don't forget to sign up for the next webinar tomorrow at noon, uh, the soil and water relationship. Now I'll give it back to Cheryl and we can maybe take some questions. Great, thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, we had one panelist say, love the slide showing the soil texture. The spigots really help me understand. I'm not sure what it means by the spigots, but it might be the little, um, the layers as it goes down. Where the, the, where the water was dropping out of. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Where the um, water was dropping out. Those very was, good. Those, it was dropping out of spigots. I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. That was very, a very good visual, I think. Also, um, we do want to emphasize that uh, this PowerPoint presentation will be available on the Citrus Heights Water District website, and you can see the link here at the bottom of the screen. And so you'll be able to download it for future reference so you can hear it. Um, also, the PowerPoint presentation itself will be there. And um, I do have another question here. So this is regarding, um, and we have just a couple of minutes left, but I, love, I would love, Steve, for you to answer this question for us. Someone wrote that they have hard clay soil, but they want to plant in it, of course, but you said not to cultivate the soil. So how can I prepare for planting without tilling, without cultivating it? Well, I, I did a, a new vegetable garden just this, this spring, and I did not till it at all. Um, the easiest way to do it is to just mow it down um, or weed it down, all the vegetation as far as you can. Then you put down earth, or ideally earthworm castings with good quality compost, and you water that in. There's lots of biology in that material. And so you, that material will leach into the soil and, and the biology will create the soil structure and then you can just go ahead and plant. Now, ideally you wanna start doing this several months in advance. Um, I know of one client who um, we tried to do a soil test and we couldn't get a soil probe into their, gr their ground um, to even sample the soil to test it. So I told her to put earthworm castings down. And she put, uh, I later learned she put down six inches of earthworm castings. But we can fall, we couldn't get a pick into that soil. By spring, just the, the, the winter rains leaching in, she could basically push her whole arm all the way up to her elbow into that soil. And so the, the, bio, the, the biology that's in the compost and the earthworm castings will open up that soil. That's great, Steve, thank you. We have another question from an attendee asking, where she can find a soil probe. Now, I know that for the little red one that you showed, if you go online yep. and Google soil sleuth, S-L-E-U-T-H, they're about 10 or $11. Those are really great if you have just planted, installed a plant because the soil around the roots is softer. If, it, if you're trying to push it into hard clay, dry soil, you will break it. You don't want to do that. Um, Steve, tell them where they can get the uh, metal soil probe that you were showing also. The, 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 metal, the metal soil probe you can get online as well, but uh, I convinced uh, Green Acres to sell them. And so Green Acres sells them. Last I knew they were, I think, under 50 bucks. Um, and uh, I, every time I've gone in there, they've always, they always have them in stock and uh, incredibly valuable tools. They're really the only way you're going to know how often to irrigate and for how long. Now I said that, you know, I had a new vegetable garden this, this year on, in, in a new site. 
And so every morning I was going out and because that soil was loose, because I put the compost down and the worm gaps down, didn't till it, um, I was able to push in with a soil sleuth and check every morning to, to see whether that soil was moist. And actually I found that the southern edge of that garden, because it was getting more sun, needed to be watered more frequently than the, 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 the spots uh, to the north that were shaded by the other plants. Thank you, Steve. So we have, we are out of time officially. Um, I do have two other questions. One was someone was asking for contact information for you. Um, and then the other is this person planted raised beds with no bottom. So I planted a 12 inch planter filled with two thirds compost and one third raised bed mix, all organic. Was this the right approach? trying to improve my clay soil. So Steve, if you can give us a quick answer, that would be great because we'll need to um, respect everybody's time here. <laughs> the issue is I don't know, you, you never know what you're getting when you, when you import materials uh, in particular. I mean, I mean, typically when the compost, you get compost, hopefully that's, that's good. Um, it depends on how well they, they, they do their composting. But uh, the blends in many cases have soil in them and they can have nutrient imbalances. They can have a lot of clay. Um, I try not to bring in and recommend not bringing in anything that contains soil. Um, if you're gonna, if you, if you wanna add quote unquote soil, uh, I recommend finding some soil in your own landscape because you know that that's not gonna contain uh, any nasty things. Great. Well, we do have some other questions that have come in. So Steve, um, maybe what we can do is get some answers on the Citrus Heights website for some of these answers, sure. because they were about how to get soil into, um, you know, how to get the soil probe into hard soil and, you know, clay soil and that sort of thing. Um, we've had some comments thanking you for your plain speak so to speak, for explaining all of this very clearly. So we'll try to get to some more answers here, but I see that we're out of time and have gone over by three minutes, so I apologize. Rex, is there anything else that you would like to add? Uh, no, I, I really want to say thank you, Steve. Um, you, you told me that I'm not using the right fertilizer, so I got something out of this. I will go organic from here on out and um, all kinds of good information. I, I, I can't say enough about how exciting soil actually is because it is very important to the garden. So bravo. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, please check the Citrus Heights Water District website, citrushheightswaterchwd.org slash watersmart hyphen class hyphen resources and you'll get there. So thank you once again for joining us and we hope that you will join us tomorrow at noon for another webinar. We're going to move into irrigating your landscape efficiently. Thank you and take care. Bye.